praise him. Peter um, has been talking to that early church, those believers that he was writing to, about their suffering, and we've already stated that they were under immense persecution and some were even losing their lives. They were going to prison. And he encourages them uh, to look at the suffering of Christ and not only to look at the suffering of Christ, but to realize the ends of the suffering, if you will. Um, suffering seems mute. It seems void if, if there's not a reason for it, right? Why am I suffering all of these things? And Peter is encouraging the believers to realize that, that God wastes nothing. Uh, God does not waste our suffering. God certainly didn't waste the suffering of Christ. And so he says in verse 18, he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Christ suffered or died once, the righteous for the unrighteous. Now think about that for just a moment. God, very God, Jesus Christ, holy, without spot, without blemish, not a single sin in his life, suffered so that we might have the righteousness of God in Christ through faith in his death, burial, and his resurrection. Folks, we don't meditate on that often enough, that, that we who are utterly sinful, whether we've performed acts of sin or it's just in our heart, we are absolutely sinful, totally depraved, separated from God because of our sin, unrighteous, that the righteous, the holy one, would suffer death and our sins would be placed on him and the wrath of God would be poured out on him. A wrath that we deserved, he took for us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he who uh, knew no sin became sin for us. And so here's what Peter is referring to, that this suffering of Christ for our sake, there was an end there was a reason for the suffering, and there was the benefit that came through the suffering. Um, Christ didn't consider himself in his deity as something to be grasped or held onto, but he humbled himself, Paul says in Philippians, and became obedient even to the point of death for us. Gosh, guys, that's a glorious thing. So we reflect on that this morning as Peter writes this. And then in verse 19, and this is a very hard verse to interpret. There are two or three main interpretations of it. And I'm going to share with you what I think is the most plausible interpretation of this verse. Uh, he says in verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Verse 20, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. There are two or three main lines of interpretation on this, but I, I think the most plausible interpretation was is that through his suffering, his death, burial, and resurrection, there was a proclamation of victory uh, to particularly fallen angels, those who had rebelled against God, that he had conquered death, spiritual death, through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so then moving on to verse 21, or the latter part of verse 20, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through the water. Verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this. So we see the eight, Noah and his family, being safely brought through the water. That's a symbolism of salvation, of deliverance. And so he says, likewise, also for the believer, the symbolism of our salvation is by baptism. Now, some interpret this verse to say that baptism is a means of salvation, but that does not hold consistently with the rest of the teaching of Scripture. Remember, anytime we make an interpretation of a passage in Scripture, it has to be theologically consistent with other writings in the Scriptures. And so we know that very clearly, it's all through Paul's letters, Christ, etc., 
that we're not saved by works. So the work of baptism does not save us. But it's the symbolism of baptism of what has already taken place in our lives, where we've trusted Christ for our salvation. Paul speaks of baptism in Romans that he says that it's a symbolism that, that we died with Christ, we were buried with him, and then we're raised to new life in Christ. And so baptism is an outward symbol of what has already taken place in the believer's life. So he says, and, and Peter makes this clear in the latter part of the verse, where he says, not, for, um, uh, not, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. So baptism doesn't save us. Baptism doesn't cleanse us. Um, that's already taken place when we trust in Christ. Baptism is an act of obedience to a command and an ordinance that we uh, celebrate in the church and the body of Christ, but it doesn't save us. Then, then he says, he concludes that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only reason that you and I are saved is because God placed our sins on Jesus and he suffered the wrath and punishment for our sins. He was buried and then he was raised again to new life so that we might too have the hope of resurrection and we will not face the second death. Uh, there's two deaths. One is our physical death when we die. The second death will be at the final judgment, um, John tells us in the book of Revelation. But those of us who've trusted Christ, we're spared that second death, if you will. We've been given new life in Christ. Then he concludes this in verse 22. He has gone into heavens and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This morning, the main thought uh, in this brief passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, is that we can hope in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That our momentary sufferings, as Peter writes early, earlier in the book, are, are just not even comparable. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't matter in the big scheme of things that, that when we recognize and look at what Christ has suffered for us, that we might have eternal salvation by placing our trust in him, having the slate of our sin wiped away clean, We've made the righteousness of God in Christ. What is it to even consider our momentary sufferings in light of that glorious truth in the resurrection of Christ? I pray you chew on these things and meditate on them today. I, I pray that you go throughout your day today and constantly be reminded that Christ paid that, that price that we owed. He took a debt on our behalf and he paid it completely. And now... By his resurrection, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, continually interceding for us. That's a reason to praise him and worship him. I pray that today that uh, we would all be conscious of opportunities and be intentional when God brings those opportunities to us of individuals who do not know Christ, that we might be able to plant a seed of the gospel. Uh, as Peter says earlier, that we might be ready to give a, a, a defense, if you will, for the hope that we have with all gentleness and meekness and humility and in love to them. And that if we come across somebody today that has already had a seed planted in their heart, that God would use us and he would prompt us by the Holy Spirit of what words to say, what our story to share, that we might help cultivate that seed of the gospel in their heart. And man, if God would bless us with the opportunity to witness, to watch him save somebody today, that would be glorious. That's my prayer today. I pray the Lord blesses you and keeps you. I look forward to seeing you this weekend, either via our, one of our media platforms or live in the service. Um, let's come prepared to worship God, um, to exalt him, to magnify his name. Jesus said that if I would be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. The purpose of our Sunday morning gatherings is that we might worship God, magnify Him, be encouraged through the Word of God, and equipped to go out and be witnesses in the mission that He's given to us. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, that He'd keep you. Have a great day, and look forward to seeing you Sunday.